Okay, round two. Um, so it looks like we maintained a lot of the people who stayed in round one. So that's always a good thing. That means the first session, which I thought was really good. I thought the feedback and the questions were fantastic. I think it's a good validation um, seeing literally so many familiar faces. Um, so we're switching gears a little bit, right? We talked a little bit about the kind of the transformation of business. Um, literally thinking about Nestle, right? You know, CPG and right, CPG is always being so right, ROI focused and kind of taking a risk and thinking about social into the marketing mix. You know, we certainly thought about rethinking the way social and search are kind of merging and certainly then the incremental impact of um, the power of the like, if you will, um, which I thought was really interesting kind of coming from the folks at Graph Effect. Um, so we're gonna switch gears like I said, a little bit and talk a lot about um, social advertising uh, or potentially lack thereof, depending on what some of our speakers have to kind of say today uh, in this session. Um, so I'm really thankful we're gonna have um, four folks present today. Um, in some type of combination. Um, Reggie Bradford from Vitru, um, along with um, you know, his client and partner um, at Casemate. And then we're gonna have David Berkowitz, who I love because he and I are very comfortable arguing in Twitter uh, openly, and it's great when you can have differing points of view and then still be on the same stage in a panel. Uh, tells you a lot. Um, and then Kristen Darcy from Oscar de la Renta. So really, kind of, again, kind of different perspectives. Um, so about a month ago, I did an interview with DigiDay, and I said, you know, social media creates an efficiency, but it's not free. Uh, but how many of you have been in a meeting where someone says, oh, we'll just do it in social, right, because it doesn't cost anything, which is kind of like what it was like in 1997 when digital first got in the scene. It was like, just do it in digital. It doesn't cost anything to do it in digital, right? It's totally free. You can make all the changes you want, and there's never any, you know, downside to that. Um, and for every one of these examples where someone launches something, two guys with a camera, and he goes, Actually, it does go viral. Um, you know, the downside of that is there's a number of cases where we have to kind of almost consider what I call the Mad Men effect. Um, I love Mad Men. I think it's a great show. Um, but how many of you routinely tune in to AMC? Exactly. Um, right? So what that means is that Mad Men has to spend a ridiculous amount of money on ABC, NBC, CBS, HBO, every place they could possibly think of to make sure you remember to flip the switch to get to the channel that you're not watching. Right? Now, hindsight 2020, NBC would have been smart enough to buy it when they had the option or ABC or HBO or someone else and would have been on a channel where you don't actually have to go ahead and spend the incremental cash to get you over to the place where we want the eyeballs to go ahead and be. And the reason I say like, you have to consider the Mad Men effect is because, I don't know about you, but like, the overwhelming trend seems to be everything from website traffic declining. Why? Because we're choosing to spend time with your brand on Facebook or on Twitter or Pinterest or Google+. Right? But now you're competing for all these other things that are on Pinterest, like this account that I follow where people make um, Lego art. And I just think it's like the coolest thing in the world, right? You know, but you're competing for all those different types of things. So how do you get someone to switch the channel to your channel when it's probably not a place they're already tuned in? Um, and it makes me consider this really interesting moment of are we in a state of pay to play, right? Digital was supposed to break down walls. It was supposed to give us efficiencies. It was supposed to let the small guy compete with the big guy because they could move faster, they could be more nimble, and they could be more efficient. But it seems to be, at least my take on it, is that we're starting to enter a very interesting area of more pay to play than we are social media and digital marketing to be creating efficiencies. Um, so about 10, 12 years ago, I worked on BMW Films when I was at Fallon. And still you know, kind of highlighted as being one of the great kind of seminal moments in thinking about digital actually leading traditional. Right? These videos were cut, they were put online first. It was at a time when broadband penetration was only about 30%. And then the TV followed after. Actually, they took all the footage online and cut them into 30s and 60s and 15s, um, which is kind of the exact opposite of how it happens today, even though they say it goes the opposite way. Right? Like, if you kind of have heard the information about like the team sprint, you know, thing that happened, right, where Digitas is leading Leo Burnett, and you know, Leo Burnett's going to play a supporting role in making Sprint a company for the future. And I don't know about you, if you kind of look at the way the work works right now, it's still TV leading digital, digital supporting. So we really haven't learned anything in almost 15 years of kind of considering this. Um, and then we had things like you know the Dove Real Beauty you know program, which was like, wow, they launched this video on YouTube and it got 20 million views. Yes, it was also supported with several million dollars worth of ad spend, right? You know, 
they understood the Mad Men effect and said, yes, we can create a video, and don't get me wrong, distribution is phenomenal on YouTube, but you still have to spend money to get people to actually look into your footage. Uh, or my favorite, right, is everyone loves to point to the work by Wyden and Kennedy for Old Spice. Um, it says, you know, it's a great example of, you know, engaging with your brand and creating great content. And um, I thought Robert Scholl yesterday during the keynote, um, kind of the back and forth with him and Guy Kawasaki was interesting where Guy said, you know, we can't just leave our markers with an answer of create really great shit and put it out there, you know, you know and that's going to take off. That can't possibly be the strategy. And with good reason, because as popular as this campaign was, the thing everybody seems to forget, it launched the Super Bowl. Super Bowl ad actually launched that campaign, and then it spawned in all the different spots you know, that took place actually in the social and digital channels. So we love to kind of celebrate these wins, but we all time, oftentimes forget, yes, even in social, which is supposed to be authentic and real and all these different kind of fun buzzwords that we throw out, it does actually take a little bit of cash. Um, and then the question is, where do you put that cash? Right? I mean, email, still, I know it's declining, it's still a viable channel. You put it into blogs, is it Flickr, is it YouTube? You focus on social spreading networks like Dig and you know, StumbleUpon. You know, is Google Plus legit? Is it not legit? Does it work good for your brand? Um, like I, love, I think the work that Ford's doing with Google Plus is brilliant. Um, you know, is it Twitter, is it Tumblr? And figuring out where to put those dollars is oftentimes kind of a tough part of the conundrum. And sometimes it makes me feel like this. It's like, where do you put that focus? Um, I think a question from the last session was really good of like, how do you focus on where to put your time and attention? And, you know, yes, it's really easy sometimes to manage your presence on these different social networks, but in terms of actually making them really strong presences, it does take time. And it takes dollars and it takes people. Um, but I think of it like this, um, you know, where you might have something that breaks on Twitter and you want it to eventually reach a blog, but all those little kind of orange dots that are connecting, it's amazing how fast you move from Twitter to YouTube to Facebook when you have those orange dots that we called advertising dollars, right? You do a sponsored trend, you do a promoted set of tweets on Twitter, amazing how you reach right to the top of the list. No different than pay-per-click with, you know, with Google AdWords, right? Or if you're in YouTube, and you actually invest the money into um, you know, the pre-roll options that they have or the branded pages, how that happens. Or when you're on Facebook and you actually spend and spend and spend and spend and spend. So while it'd be great to think that Twitter and the blogs and YouTube and email and all those other different things kind of play really well together, the fact is you sort of need some of these different pieces in between, don't you? Uh, at least I think we do. Um, you know, and I think a lot of my colleagues kind of would agree with that. Um, and then the question I want everyone to think, like if you remember nothing from this two hours if you attended the first session, it's this. Is Facebook our friend or is Facebook our friend of me? It's a question I ask at almost every single conference or summit that I attend. And here's why I ask the question. Let's think about a traditional way that someone's gonna measure the ROI on Facebook. You have two million fans. 15% of them actually tune into your information. That's Facebook's number, not my number. That means that 30, 300,000 people actually see your message. Great, we're gonna take a nice conservative click-through rate of 10%, which is really conservative. 30,000 of them end up at your site, 10% of them end up buying, and they buy something that's worth 10 bucks. So, from two million to $30,000, that's what we're gonna go ahead and measure it, right? So what can you control? You can control the top of the funnel, you can optimize different things to route. So what does Facebook tell us? Well, at FMC, what they said to us was, the solve is reach generator. Now we're going to help you reach 75% of your fans, not the 15%. Right? It increases the volume of your engagement. You receive custom monthly reports. Now think about that, custom monthly reports. You actually get real data coming back out of Facebook. But you have to spend in order to be able to actually get it. And they show you, right, before reach generator, you get about 20%. So I gave you 15, which was conservative. At the end of it, you get about 75. But here's the key part that sometimes gets overlooked. Um, this package is only available for qualifying clients. Preach, right? Reach out to your account team to learn more. And really what that means is if you're going to spend enough to actually support Reach Generator for a significant amount of time, then yes, we can give you Reach Generator. So again, when I think about pay to play, that's pay to play. Facebook isn't free. You know, it's never been free um, by any stretch of the imagination and nor has social, right? So it's an accelerator, but it still requires some amount of financial investment. Um, that said, I have this really strong belief that great products with zero social media will always beat really bad products with great social media. Um, like I just fundamentally believe that. You know, if someone has a great product, 
And we saw it with actually the graph effect demo. They tell you about it, you click here, you share it. Like you inherently have that baked into it. Doesn't mean that you still don't need the ad spend to amplify it, but I will always take a great product with zero social media support than I will with a for-profit lots of social. And kind of my favorite seminal example of this, um, here's the current stock price um, as of Friday between Dell and Apple. Now, Dell is heralded as having some of the most sophisticated social media monitoring marketing programs you could ever possibly imagine in the world. And Apple doesn't do anything in social. I mean, yes, they have like a Twitter account that I believe gives you like information about like iTunes songs, but that's really it. But do you really need a Twitter account to promote the iPad, right? Because you all wanted it, everyone bought it, you know, or the iPhone, right? I mean, we already have people who are talking about the iPhone 5 and hasn't even released, right? There's already a pent up demand. You give me a great product, I'll take that over socially any day of the week, any day of the week. But it kind of again, you know, creates this quandary or this, you know, this question that's there. Um, do you have to pay? Is it free? How much of it is inefficiency? And I think that's what we're going to sort of get through today with um, our three different kind of presenters. Um, now that said, I will gladly take $20 million more, right? I mean, I'll have a great product. If you want to give me $20 million more, I will gladly take it, right? You know, if I have a concept like the Old Spice campaign and you want to pay for a Super Bowl spot at $5 million and you want to pay for the production cost of $2.5 million, I will gladly take an increment of $8 million to spend. I'm the last person who's going to turn away $8 million or $20 million. But there's a balance to it, and I think hopefully through the next 45 minutes, we're going to get through what's that right balance? How do you kind of blend the paid side of it versus the altruistic, you know, what we like to hopefully believe that social does, right? That it's a, it levels the playing field, that it gives the little guys a chance to beat the big guys. And I think that's what we all hoped that it does. Um, I hope that these concepts like Reach Generator or the $700,000 it takes to get the logout screen on Facebook are things that are potentially going to go away. Because honestly, it creates a situation where it's always been what it's always been. If you can outspend, you can win. And I'd like to believe you know, that part of why we all got into social is to kind of reverse that uh, traditional very course of action. Um, so with that, I'm going to actually uh, have Reggie Bradford and uh, Kathleen Astier come up. And they're going to talk a little bit about Bitru and Casemate. Um, and following that, uh, David Berkowitz from 360i is going to come up, and then Kristen Darcy. Um, so please welcome them. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. And um, this is my friend Kathleen Hester from Casemate. And uh, just Apple does have a pretty substantial social media presence. They're, they've got about 20 million fans on Facebook, um, on iTunes. And it was largely generated organically. So I did want to make that point, um, although I, I, I take the point, Adam, on the where is this headed with Reach Generator. So let me, let me tell you about Vitru real quick. We're a platform that largely is focused on owned and earned media in the, in the parlance of the conversation today. We work with about 500 marketers to essentially use our software to manage their connections and relationships that they've, they are building on Facebook, on Twitter, YouTube, uh, Google+, and more recently, uh, uh, Pinterest and um, uh, Instagram. And um, as Adam mentioned, this, this world is proliferating. It's very confusing for marketers. There's more and more social networks that are developing every day. There's more content. There's more news. There's more uh, growth and, and focus. Um, and our platform helps marketers like McDonald's, PNG, uh, unlock the value of social. We've been in this business for, I guess, almost six years. We actually are, are big believers in Facebook, as, uh, as I've been saying for a while, that they're the operating system of the internet in some respects, and, and they're really the hub of every, hub and spoke of every social marketing strategy from our perspective, um, and, and, a, and a place you've got to be with the 850 million consumers. But I wanted real quick, um, I think Adam brought up a great point on the, on the playing field. I was uh, early in my career a CMO of WebMD that was, uh, when it started and, and we had nothing and we were facing very large entrenched uh, traditional healthcare providers and you know back in the late 90s the internet was the great leveling leveling of the playing field and WebMD created a five billion dollar company almost overnight through the internet that took down some of the larger giants um, in the space and um, if you look at like Casemate a, a very small company that started six years ago Kathleen and uh, and has been growing extremely rapidly all over the world. So why don't you tell us about uh, a little bit about Casemate? Hey guys, um, Casemate is a small CPG company based out of Atlanta. We're in Tucker, Georgia, uh, right up from Atlanta, and we create fun, fashionable accessories for smartphones and tablets. Um, there's a ton of competitors in the space, so 
uh, one of the things that makes us unique is a tool called that we call I Make My Case, where you can go online through our website and create a custom case with images, logos, um, pictures from Facebook and Instagram, and you can rearrange them on your case and then submit it and we'll print it out for you. So one of the things that we were looking to do was promote this tool uh, to bring us uh, apart from our competitors and I guess we'll go into it. We reached out to Vitru to work with them, so I guess we'll go into a little bit more about that. Great product, I got it right here. <laughs> okay, you wanna talk about the campaign? Okay, so we were approached by Kevin Smith's team to work with them at Comic-Con, um, and one of the reasons that we wanted to work with them is because he has a huge following of graphic design artists, comic book artists, um, lots of different people. Uh, Kevin Smith, for those of you who don't know, pr produced um, several movies that were big cult films in the 90s, like um, Dogma, Clerk, Small Rats, Jane Silent Bob Strike Back. So we worked with them to create a design contest where originally we were just going to have people go to our websites and go through the, the process of uh, designing something and then submit, putting it on the case, but we decided to actually run this through Facebook to tap into our fan following, which at the time we had about 150,000 fans, um, and we were going to support it with an ad buy and reach out to everybody on Facebook that was interested in the different films and different, um, go, if they were going to Comic-Con, if they're talking about Comic-Con, if they were interested in comic books in general, all sorts of different things that were related to Kevin Smith's following. Um, so what we did was we worked with Vitru and we built out a UGC model or user-generated content model where people would design, the, at, they would design the Jay and Silent Bob um, designs at home and then they would submit them through the module and once they were submitted people could go and vote uh, um, We would actually we took those out and we put them into an album also so people could go and comment on them and b Give different feedback let us know if people were cheating if they'd pull these images off of Google or if they actually decorated did it themselves and follow the directions that we gave them um, We ran it for about two weeks and got thousands and thousands of votes on the different entries We got over 250 original amazing pieces of artwork that people were submitting the gallery We got tens of thousands and thousands of comments people coming in telling us people that were cheating or Supporting others that did a great job um, People from all over the world were coming in submitting different pieces of artwork um, ten thousands of likes 40 million impressions 25 million social impressions and 1.5 million post views so it was very very successful oh sorry <laughs> Um, but yes, we did support this with an ad buy, and like I said, we reached out to all th through these different channels. We could target people in different regions and see where they were coming in. Um, it was, I, the things that I noticed for the most part were the, the ad, I think, this that we used, for those of you who have run Facebook social campaigns, I'll go back to the, um, faces do much better than if you just put up a logo, obviously. Um, people coming in, you can target their friends or friends of friends. You can reach out and to all sorts of different demographics. Um, we, I noticed that when you spend the majority of your budget in the beginning, instead of just spreading it out and allocating a different amount for each day, that you get a much, much better cost per follower. Um, all sorts of different so just like the, the, the key to success, I guess, and the mix between like your owned and earned and then how you ampl amplified that through paid, maybe we can talk about that. <laughs> the the sort of the how you thought about the owned and earned and, and building the presence versus amplifying that with paid and what what you would have done differently maybe in the future. Yeah, um, one of the things I was also surprised about was that we had Kevin Smith um, pushing out messaging about the campaign through his Twitter and Facebook page and by announcing it on his podcast. And I noticed at the end that we only got about twenty five hundred followers through all of that. Um, if we kind of looked at how it was tied back, but then we got about 50,000 through the Facebook ad following, or through the, the Facebook ads that we put out there. Um, so basically, it's another example of how you can't expect things to go viral just through the following. So, so one other thing I just wanna mention is, um, and now this is at the intersection of owned, earned, and paid is, you know, through the dashboard, you can now see which post is driving the most organic impressions, which post is most popular fans, that you can actually amplify that into a story. So that's something that perhaps might have made sense going forward to, you know, as a, whether it's reach generator or, or driving more paid to a, to a story that actually is resonating with the fans. Absolutely, at the time we did this back in July and that was an option, but any time that you can use, you can figure out which images are getting people's attention, you wanna use those as your ad or for your sponsored story. And definitely now with reach generator, um, knowing what catches people's eye it is, 
much, much more important because people are visual and they're not going to read your text most, most likely. I mean, Pinterest is a perfect example of that. So, um, yeah, no, I would definitely, definitely use a tool like that to figure out what to put out there in front of people. All right. Uh, great. David, I think you're next. Everyone, uh, toy pants, huh? All right. Uh, so, yeah, I want to. Uh, so I, I kind of wanted to spend more time on that case study too because I really liked it. And, um, <laughs> but I, I will talk a bit about uh, another marketer. One I'm a big fan of, USA Networks. They've been a great client of ours, 360i. So we're a digital marketing agency, and so so working with uh, a lot of entertainment and consumer brands and. I want to share one example in particular uh, about USA Network because it just, uh, you know, working with them over the years, they really are one of the more progressive, forward-thinking brands when it comes to using paid, earned, and owned together. So, big challenge, and I think uh, Adam set it up pretty well. I, we won't have any Twitter rivalries about this here, anything he was talking about today. There is a big issue with getting content seen in social, and so especially like uh, you start seeing some of these reach metrics, and uh, uh, yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that's you know the potential reach is not the actual reach of your social program. So so you really do have to do a lot to figure out how to use all your assets together uh, and get the most visibility, and uh, but while still you know getting a decent bang for the buck. And, uh, and so it's really, you know, how do you marry this kind of investment? I thought it was really uh, interesting with the whole Mad Men example, because uh, USA, they've, they've got a little more consistency with a lot of their programming, but they're also, they're also looking to where all these conversations are happening and where, you know, where this chatter is about their shows, about their characters, their actors, and so that they're just not just relying on, say, trying to blast promotions across other TV networks. There's a lot that they have to work with already when they can figure out you know, where these people are and how to harness it and, and grow that for a bigger social effect. So, uh, and, and this, in a nutshell, is just what that overarching strategy looks like. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, um, but, uh, but this, this, you know, for, for 360i, working with the USA, I mean, that's uh, yeah, there's like always what the game plan looks like. So we, yeah, it's an easy thing to uh, yeah, keep on the on the planning room wall there because uh, uh, there are, there are a lot of assets that can really be blended together. So uh, yeah, there are really three pillars that we're looking at, and just to sum them up briefly. So with planning, it's a big part of it because you do need this constant editorial calendar. I mean, you need a lot of flexibility with that as well, but there's always just opportunities to look ahead. And, and what's interesting when you look at the whole earn and pay to know and integration is that you that when planning a content calendar, there are opportunities to say, hmm, well, hmm, let's try to plan something that might work well in paid media too. And so not just see this as something that's only going to, to live as, as some kind of earned or owned media. So this also really changes a lot of the nature of what our community or content managers are doing when they realize, well, in a sense, they're writing ad copy as well, or very well could be, uh, yeah, as the course of the campaign or program develops. Uh, execution, you know, you've got to respond really quickly, and it's also something that we've learned over the years. I mean, I've been there six years and seen a lot of changes, and, and one of the biggest is that approach to integration. And so it's, it, it, you, it's a very literal thing where you're having the media managers and the community managers and social strategists and account people all talking to each other on a very regular basis. So uh, it's a huge part of it. And then, and then just having some kind of uh, system to have a steady flow of data coming in that you're continually keeping track of and then being able to respond quickly based on that. So I'll share a few examples of what that looks like with, with USA and one that's worked really well for them was Hashtag Killer. So uh, a really fun show, they've got, got Psych. And uh, so what we were looking at was, well, 
what are the posts that are performing really well organically that then we can translate into paid media? What can they do to, uh, it's like, what are the ads that are gonna work best? Well, a lot of it's coming from the content that's already happening. And so, so we're looking at that, and then we're also constantly updating the campaign based on what the current episodes are, yeah, 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 who's starring in them, a lot of these plot hooks. So, so a lot of this, what we're continually optimizing here is just to uh, uh, get those engagement hooks. A lot of it, not surprisingly for an entertainment brand, is around video sharing. So, uh, so you see those video units constantly coming up. And they also created a great game with it, and, and you know, we're able to get quite a bit of engagement based on it. So, and there are you know, lots of kinds of engagement hooks that they're looking at. Uh, so also when they're doing all this, so Twitter is a really important channel for USA. There's a lot of chatter going on there. And for their promoted tweets, they're also, uh, yeah, so William Shatner made an appearance, so they were using that, had a custom hashtag for it. This is also one that it, uh, we've seen some interesting examples of hashtag uh, hijacking and brand jacking coming up. It's going to be very hard to hijack this one when it's that specific about uh, Shatner on Psych, and it's something that fans were really excited about. And then, uh, and then having sp fans spreading the word. So if they're uh, so a any of the related terms going on there, what they're really looking to do is then yeah, uh, get that uh, get that up, even see if they can make it a trending topic in some markets, and and expose even more people right. Uh, right around when that show is going to air. And then uh, there was a, a, also a, a pretty interesting program done for White Collar, another, another one of their hit shows. So, uh, so the, after one of the seasons, there was a lot of conversations about the, this hook, Where's Elizabeth Burke, who you might remember uh, as uh, Tiffany Theason. And so, uh, so people were organically buzzing about this quite a bit, and so what we were talking with USA during the off season, and and especially as this, you know, during a slower time, and trying to think, well, okay, before this comes on the air, what can we do? Because the conversation it was out there, and, and we knew that fans wanted to be reengaged with this. So there was a whole site created. There were a lot of ads uh, you know, uh, running, uh, uh, you know, display and search. A lot of things made to look like. Uh, you know, like these uh, missing person posters and uh, everything. So trying to then direct that back. And again, it was all based on the chatter that was going out, on out there. So we knew that for the fans themselves to get them re-engaged, that this was a, a no-brainer of a hook to use and were able to get, the, uh, uh, get that performing really well. Uh, drove nearly 60,000 video streams and, uh, and just for the uh, the game site in particular was a, a good 76,000 unique viewers. So in summary, yeah, I'll uh, bucket a little extra time for the Q&A there, yeah, really it's about you know, growing this audience that's apt to engage. You really want to find where that audience is as a starting point and then see how you can grow it from there. And then, and then it's looking at the two-way street here. So it's using earned media to then amplify the paid media on a very real-time basis, and then using paid to surface a lot of the great content out there. And then sometimes you have great content that uh, uh, people just aren't seeing for various reasons, and, and maybe it's just a especially an especially noisy day or uh, or, or something that you think you know, should perform better than it does. Well, paid media winds up being a, a great hook to get that going, and then you, know, you could track the performance of both together and see what's really resonating and then keep optimizing along those cycles. So uh, on that note, I'm gonna pass this over to Kristen and, uh, and look forward to the Q&A. Thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Kristen Darcy, SVP of e-commerce and digital media at Oscar de la Renta. I'd like to start by asking a question. How many people knew that we make children's wear? Two, two people, three perhaps. 
Great. Well, hopefully by the end of this presentation, not only will you be interested in possibly purchasing one of our adorable rompers, but hopefully you'll get a better understanding of how to use niche marketing um, through paid, owned, and earned channels to really drive awareness among particular customer segments. So how do you use digital to launch a, a new brand category? Obviously, you have to know your brand. You have to understand who that target is that you're trying to influence. Test and learn, of course, to find your, your optimal mix of paid, owned, and earned media, particularly with um, you know, budgets that are very different than some of the other marketers that we've talked about here. And then develop and embrace the omni-channel consumer. So let's start with tapping into the core brand promise, ensuring differentiated messaging. What does that mean? We are a brand about glamour and elegance. We have a multi-generational, clearly with the launch of children's wear, appeal. However, depending on the channel with where we were promoting our message, we tried to tweak our communication with the understanding of the channel and the people who belong there. So for example, the playground's getting chicer. You saw that message on all of our, our social channels. Why? Because on Facebook, for example, the largest fan group is between the ages of 18 and 24. That's very different than, let's say, another consumer segment who's paying full price for our gowns or our ready-to-wear dresses. Second biggest consumer segment it begins at 35, goes up to 45. So again, we wanted a, a more playful approach there with our messaging. Finest fabrics and beloved silhouettes really speak to what I think our brand is, is best known for and that's quality and unique manufacturing that everyone has come to know and love for Oscar de la Renta. So in that channel, for the promotion around the fabrics and the beloved silhouettes, quality messaging, for example, that was promoted with all of our owned channels. So on our website, through our emails, through paid search. And then finally, price was a different tactic. Price actually was more of an acquisition play. So when we look at our paid media support, that was really around trying to find new audiences and appealing to them with a price point. So the launch of our children's wear actually is probably among the lowest um, price of our goods at $65. And we thought we could really start to fill the funnel with qualified leads by banking on a price message there. Finally though, and most importantly, there was a very consistent thread. Ad imagery and tonality overall aligned with our, our brand and our brand footprint was consistent, we just tweaked our messaging again based on those different channels. How about audience? So how many people here are brand marketers versus on the agency side? Okay, I would say about a quarter or so. So if you're anything like me, you want to measure everything to death. And if your budgets are pretty limited, and again, we can't run TV ads, which is one of the best sort of awareness generators, then where do you, where do you go? What do you do? Well, you fish where the, the fish swim. You drive excitement and awareness among current customers, and you do that through an a excellent PR team, and then you acquire customers to the brand with a new product offering. So, that's, that's all well and good. At the end of the day, though, the traditional funnel is no longer. So we've, we've been able to move people through awareness, familiarity, consideration, purchase, and loyalty probably, I would say, up until the past couple of years. And then something happened. Messengers, advocates, and co-creators are the future. Oscar actually says, now is the most exciting time in fashion. Women are controlling their destiny now. And the consumer, well, she's more knowledgeable. Why is that? It's because we've turned the funnel on its head. People are more influenced by word of mouth, by people they trust, than let's say brands who are pushing out their messages. So if we go back a slide, again, being a marketer who wants to quantify everything, and I can with email, with paid search, with affiliates, with conversions on the website, what do I do in a world that is out of my control? And that's where I think the opportunity to take a look at paid, owned, and earned and make each channel work for you to not only communicate that consistent brand voice, but drive conversion and try to marry the success among those disparate channels is really interesting. So that's essentially what we did. We developed a through-the-line strategy. We partnered with PR to drive awareness and buzz 
among not only our social channels, but also through print, through relationships with bloggers, for example, um, and then obviously the, the community of editors. We tested and learned with paid social tactics, so I'll show you some screenshots of that in just a moment. And then being um, a traditional marketer, if you will, we fueled the direct response marketing channels and really filled the funnel with qualified leads. And again, those are much more sort of ROI-based tactics. And finally, if I'm looking at a sort of soup to nuts operation, I need to make sure that I deliver an experience that pays off all of the traffic that we've generated to the site. So the site has to be functional, it has to be easy to shop, and of course we have to throw in a couple surprise and delights, and then also try to stimulate that omni-channel consumer, and we can do that on the site. So let's take a look at the creative. From the earned perspective, Oscar PR Girl is our Twitter handle. She has about 120,000 followers. And I think she's done such a great job because she enables consumers to take a peek behind the curtain and really engage with our brand. Um, we just launched, probably about two months ago, something called The Board. And we've asked consumers to submit pictures, poems, quotes, etc., that inspire them. And perhaps Oscar will pick from one of those to feature a new design in our next collection. So we're really asking people to co-create. So for example, within uh, Twitter, we have the message, we just took the plague around to another level, our children's wear collection is available starting now, and then we featured a link. We don't do that very often, as a matter of fact, in Twitter, but we were really excited about this launch, and you see the communication is a little bit more casual. We know our audience pretty well there. Just below that, Pinterest is something that we've been exploring over the past few months as well. Um, we have a couple of different boards on there, Oscars favorites, for example, fall must-haves, and then we featured children's front and center during the launch. And then finally, Tumblr, of course, is a place where we're able to really romance imagery, so we featured one of the ad campaign shots there as well. And, and, and I should also mention we had a number of Facebook posts that drove back to the site. So in the owned area, which I would say falls more in line with that um, I can control it, I understand the old McKinsey marketing model area of, of expertise, owned we sent a dedicated email to our full database the day the, the product was available on the site. And then a week later, we did some really interesting um, segmentation. We took a look at everyone who had clicked on children's from that last email and served them up an email a week later that coupled not only the, our, our ready to wear full look image, but we put that alongside different children's looks. And then if you had not clicked on that email, you would still receive Parade Your Sunday Best, but this time we featured jewelry in that right hand column. What's interesting is that I think it was among the first time, and probably because we had the new launch, that we were trying to associate the children's line alongside our ready-to-wear pieces and really trying to drive that cross-selling of merchandise. So the idea is if you're spending X amount of money on children's, then you might add to your shopping cart with a new look for Easter, let's say. And I should um, also mention that compared to LY, as well as every other email sent this year over the past quarter, these two were the best performing emails in regards to traffic and overall revenue generation. And again, I, I think we saw particular success with that second email because we tapped into behavior and we served up a message that was so behaviorally relevant then a week later. Also on the own channel, just to try to surround that consumer with that 360 degree consistent messaging. Um, on the website, certainly, if you just typed in the direct URL, you would see a promo box there directing people to shop now. And then we align that next to the social, the social message of visiting the board. So that's what I had mentioned earlier. Um, people are able to submit to Inspire Oscar. And then finally, when you're on the product detail page, you would click in, so right now you're in baby boy, and now we're starting to make people aware and hopefully start to stimulate the omni-channel consumer. So for example, we sell our children's wear through trunk shows. We have a call to action here asking people if they're interested in attending. Right alongside that, you're able to shop, 
And then the surprise and delight piece is, let's say that one of these items were on pre-order and you wanted to get a better understanding of fabric or fit before you decided to pre-order and wait X amount of weeks to, to get your goods. Well, we've developed something called the personal shopper. And I like to think of this group of people as being um, white glove, a white glove concierge service that helps walk you through your purchase, whether that's children's or if that's of a gown, ready to wear bags, et cetera. Basically what that means is it's not just a customer service uh, warehouse somewhere, but these people are sitting with the product on hand. So they're able to touch and feel and really give all of our callers a sense as to fit as to fabric quality, um, length, and so forth. And we found that incredibly beneficial in helping drive conversion. So we featured that on this item detail page as well. And then finally, in the paid arena, so we know who our customers are, and our consumers are a little bit younger in those social channels. I know who my customers are then in the database. And from a very high, high level who's coming to the site. So how do I really try to attract and acquire new customers then and those that I know our message would be ripe for? So we actually partnered with parenthood.com on a couple of different fronts. We sent out a dedicated email to their database, so that's featured on the left. And that's where I mentioned earlier, we decided to include that price message just in case there was a misperception that the prices um, were higher, let's say, than the starting price point of $65. So we sent out an email. We were also featured on their homepage in a rotating promo box there. And then finally, we were featured in their digital magazine that just went out about a week ago. And what's interesting about their digital magazine is that it enables um, shareability. So not only were we able to tap into those people who received the magazine or who had stumbled upon it on the site, but then we knew that it could go, our message could go viral as well. Also on the paid side, something that we explored when I joined Oscar now about eight months ago, we had never been on affiliate sites before. And having worked with a number of other brands, I do believe in the power of affiliates. So Shop Style, we've been on board with them for about five or six months now, and they've been an exceptional partner. So we are rolling out ad units on Shop Style in the next couple of weeks, but currently you're able to shop our products catalog, which is featured uh, on the screenshot in the upper left. And that was one area of paid on the affiliate side. The other were actually Facebook paid ads driving back to OscarDeLaRenta.com. This is one of the first uh, explorations that we've ever done in using Facebook ads to drive to the site versus try, trying to drive to the page for likes or to enter contests on the page and so forth. So what we did here was a really interesting test. We split the two units into uh, two different messages, one for, for people who liked the page and one who hadn't. And I, I think we took a really um, sort of niche targeted approach here. The ones who liked the page, we filtered those people out by, by age. So it was 30 to 50 years old. They needed to have children between the ages of zero and 12. That's the sizing. And then they could also be expecting um, parents. So within our fan world, if you will, the number of people exposed to that ad was actually pretty low because we were being so, so targeted. I would say it was about 1,000. But then we ran a second ad, and we wanted to drive awareness of the line with people who perhaps were in the same demographics, who also had children, 0 to 12 years old, but maybe they had low awareness that we had ever launched a children's line. That universe was much larger, upwards of 500,000. So we've been running those ads now for about two weeks. We've seen really strong traffic from Facebook. And I think the opportunity then for, um, for, for me, as, as I look at the site, is really to try to develop different content, uh, content on the site to help drive conversion of all of those people that we're sending from Facebook. So if you've ever visited our site, I like to think that from an e-commerce perspective, um, it's, it's pretty good. We're getting better. We're, we're relaunching in the next couple of months. But what we'll also do, it, besides streamlining the functionality and the navigation, is add some content so people can really get a sense of who Oscar de la Renta is as a brand. And I'm hoping then we can take all of that traffic that's being driven from Facebook and really start to convert it because we're speaking to a different audience then. 
Lastly, obviously SEM is a no-brainer. We started running those ads a couple weeks prior to launch just so we could start to build volume and fill the funnel even before the product was available on the site. So I touched on omni-channel customers a little bit and, and why it's important that we drive growth among that consumer segment. And it's because they spend more. They're more loyal overall to the brand. They're shopping with us more often. Their AOV is higher. And we don't see omni-channel customers as, as cannibalizing business. We see them as adding to it. So shop in our store on Madison and then come see me online and then we might send you an offer to go back to Madison um, to attend one of our trunk shows or one of our events. We also are developing uh, an iPad application so that we can cross-sell merchandise during some of these trunk shows, again, to drive greater exposure around the breadth of our product line. And then finally, I think you can drive that omni-channel consumer through digital, so utilizing SEM to drive in store through local search, for example. If somebody is trying to pull up designer dresses, then we can feature our Ball Harbor or our Madison Avenue location. So learnings, we've been about three weeks in now. And what have I learned? Micro-targeting works. Um, case in point would be the email. We also have the opportunity to deepen virability opportunities on OscarDeLaRenta.com. So I talked about developing content around where we know we're getting the majority of our traffic. And again, that's content that lets people bond with the brand on the site. Right now, you can browse some videos. There's a timeline about the house. But with the launch of the new site, I think you'll really be able to engage with us more deeply, understand who we are. And then we're able to ignite those people, not only off of the site, but in our other social channels. And the other opportunity, too, besides emailing a friend, is figuring out how we can um, get people to share from the site a little bit more freely. So we're excited about that. Also utilizing attribution modeling to show that perfect mix of above and below the line conversion. So was it an exposure to a search ad plus an email plus your our Facebook fan that drove a purchase? Um, and I think what's interesting there, even outside of children's, is that my hypothesis is that that mix is going to be different depending on the product category. So we'd love to explore that. Test mobile search to drive in-store visits. We've talked a little bit about that. And then finally, continuing to partner with PR to drive awareness, buzz, and overall engagement as we continue um, to, to really blow out this initiative across seasons. That is fun. Great. I think we all could agree we all could use a personal shopper. Um, so let's bring our kind of group of presenters back up, much like we did in the last session. And I definitely want to make sure we get to your questions. And I have one I want to kick off with uh, once kind of everyone gets up here on, uh, on the stage. Um, so I think one of the things that was interesting to kind of watch um, throughout the different presentations was the, and Kristen calls it omni-channel, um, you know, I think David showed a really good graph of paid own and earned kind of working together. I know there was even a breakout session yesterday, I think they called it POM, um, or POM, or POM. Um, as you, I guess, as you all think about where you're betting on, um, where would you guys put your first dollar? Would you put your first dollar into the above the line stuff? Would you put it in the below the line stuff? Would you put it in social? Would you put it into, where social is going to potentially lead to. Um, I think that's something that I think came out of the first half of the social kind of master series is prioritization. And, you know, Kristen, your point, dollars are certainly not infinite. Um, I wish we all had Pepsi dollars. Um, that'd be fantastic. Um, but if you kind of think about where would you put that in and kind of what you've seen, whether it's through micro targeting or just thinking about the balance of paid, own, and earned um, to kind of see a catalyst for explosion of growth. Um, so David, we'll actually, we'll start with you. Hey, well, uh, yeah, it, you know, it really depends on the clients we're working with. I mean, for, you know, for a lot of them, it will look to certain, you know, we're digital agencies, so we're only focused on digital in that case. 
uh, and you know, we'll look to capture as much demand as there is, but there's usually a limit to that uh, kind of demand So you know, for things like search. So a lot of it is then you know, what are the most effective ways we can generate demand. And, and for some, yeah, that, I mean, there are great opportunities in display and elsewhere, but there's uh, uh, just more and more that we're shifting to social. I think it depends on a brand's website and again, how they're going to pay off things that are promoted in social. So right now, if I had to allocate my dollars, it would be towards SEM, email, to a degree, affiliates. In a couple of months with the new website, I would definitely allocate a portion to social in a much greater way than I am right now. As the social media manager, I tend to put all of our budget in social, um, <laughs> but we, as far as social channels that I invest in, um, Facebook, of course, is huge for us. We allocate a big number of dollars to growing our fan page, and um, we a lot of it is about building brand engage or building brand love. Um, but we've we've seen sales and trial of our, our trial of our I make my case tool increase drastically with the different promotions that we've run. Um, another thing that we're experimenting though now with is Twitter, and I've seen a lot of, uh, of a lot of engagement come through um, through Twitter and being pushed to Facebook and ramping up our promotions, and then of course increasing trials on our website. So Twitter and Facebook are the two that I'd definitely pay attention to, and Pinterest, of course, in the future is something that is next on my list of uh, we're already using it a lot. But if they add in an ad module or something, I'll definitely test out that. Um, I would say what we've seen in terms of clients that have done it right is starting with strategy. You know, what is the, what is the essence of my brand and, and what attributes do I have that really are going to resonate in social and how do I leverage that? And um, I'm biased, obviously, because I think eight out of nine people buy products and services based upon a recommendation from a peer or friend, according to Nielsen or whatever. And so I think that you got to start there and then I think you got to think global from day one. And so, you know, there's so many different ways to take advantage of creating and, and, and having an empowering, as a marketer, empowering direct relationship with your consumers and segmenting and targeting those consumers on a global basis, I think is, is really where to start. Yeah. So apparently anyone who thought email was dead, it's not dead, as we've seen kind of across the board, even in the first session. Um, and there may be actually some life support for Google+, Plus, just given its impact on SEO. I saw a question over there. Uh, so I heard um, sponsored stories on Facebook mentioned a couple times, and uh, that's a relatively new item in the arsenal there on Facebook advertising. And I was just wondering if uh, any of you had experienced better results with sponsored stories re relative to the more traditional Facebook ads, or if it's kind of a wash. Who wants to take it? Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start. I mean, a lot of it depends on, uh, I mean, sponsored stores are great for, for really, and you know, what they're now calling their premium inventory. I mean, it, it's great for really big brand pushes. And so, uh, uh, so there's definitely, definitely a place for it, but it, it really depends. Like, it, there's not some kind of unequivocal thing I've seen of like, okay, yeah, I've got to do this at the expense of the other. And, and we've seen a lot of the examples of uh, just uh, some of these more fine-tuned targeting working really, really well. So. Okay, we got a question over here. So if you were starting your own small business, say you're selling t-shirts on the web and you had a $1,000 a month budget for PR advertising, what would you spend it on each of you? Because um, all the t a lot of talk here at AdTech has been on people that have very large corporate budgets, but you all have the expertise to make your own business too. I think what's interesting is that you know we're not spending on Twitter, for example, and we have a following of 120,000 people. We're not spending um, on Pinterest. We could be linking in, in different ways. But we're, we're not spending there, and we're not spending on Tumblr. So we have enough of a presence, and we really haven't spent a lot on Facebook um, overall. So I think you could utilize each of those channels and uh, complementary, and then start to fuel the marketing dollars with things such as, and I, I go back to it, but such as search. 
Um, you have to be creative, obviously, with your keywords because you're going to be up against brands with pretty big budgets. But depending on how you try to talk about your t-shirts, let's say, you, you could be pretty inventive there. And I also don't think, back to the point about email being dead, neither are list rentals. So just to try to generate awareness there um, could be interesting. And then finally, partnering with other bloggers. So let them help spread the word virally. And if the relationships are deep enough, you can do that complimentary as well. And I would just add, if I was starting a business, which I've started before, I'm on my third startup, I would start on Facebook. I mean, there's a billion people. And look at the amount of companies that are billion-dollar companies that have created in the last five years using Facebook as a medium to develop that massive awareness. So, actually, I'm going to piggyback. I know we have a question over there. So... What, do you, what are your thoughts, you know, to your point of kind of on investing in Facebook? Um, what happens if Facebook issues the Facebook tax, right? For every like that you have, we're going to charge you 10 cents per like per month, you know, to maintain access, you know, to that customer. Because, right, because you don't own your data on Facebook. Facebook owns your data about your customer. You know, and certainly, I, I, David, I see, we got you. Um, you know, with the, obviously with their IPO, there's going to be a greater emphasis on revenue generation, which is where things like Reach Generator came out and the $700,000 on the exit page, um, which is actually why I kind of posed the question earlier on. Can we think of Facebook in a friend context or in a frenemy when you think about the monetization of their ability to wall off their garden any which way that they choose? Um, so on the small business side, I think you're right. Facebook gives some scale. How do you balance the potential for them to change the game every month, it seems? Um, I'll... I'll start because I've got a uh, $33 million venture capital raise so far that's completely based on Facebook, so it's a little scary, but um, it's, 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 a, it's a risk that we, our investors have, have saw the risk, but then the reward. And I've, you know, we personally, you know, our company's got a great relationship with Facebook. It's not contractual. There's no uh, tolls or anything like that. It's based upon trust and value creation together. And um, I think that there, there's always that sort of threat, I guess. Um, I've never seen it. I've never heard it. We've never talked about it. Um, but I think the opportunities that, that I see in the excitement is, you know, well dwarfs the, the concerns about the tariff and tax. But I'm encouraged as a platform that marketers are, are also interested and other, other, other social products like Twitter, like YouTube, like Google, like Pinterest. I think that's good for Facebook, and I think it's good for the ecosystem. Uh, there is a Facebook tax, and it's called the Reach Generator. Uh, and so uh, it, uh, you see that Facebook saying that brands have between single digits and, and a great brand might be able to reach 20% you know, of their audience through uh, just the organic posts. So, so they've got us where they want us. Yeah, uh, they're doing better at showing the value of it. They're doing better at rolling out the analytics like what Google did. It's like, we'll give you the data for free and it's going to make you want to spend more on it. And so, so, and now what's amazing with Facebook too is that everyone there is so consistent. I mean, product managers, people who didn't know anything about advertising three months ago, they're saying, the answer to your question is spend more money on Facebook. That's where I want that extra 20 million. So my question is for the woman from um, Oscar. The, the question I had was um, looking at um, you know, Tumblr and Pinterest and email and those pieces. Um, I'm sure there are lots of conversations around focusing on product versus focusing on some of the other brand messages that you talked about. I know that's something as a brand marketer that we are debating a lot is, you know, do we have more of a product, um, uh, you know, kind of presence with those different vehicles or do we try to focus more on some of the deeper brand messages of our business's mission, vision, and some of those things introducing people to more of the brand. So I just would love to get your thoughts because it seems like from what I saw, it was a little bit more product focused. But um, then you kind of said at the end that you're trying to introduce people a little bit more to the actual brand and the, what it stands for. So I just was curious about those conversations. Great question. And I think most brands struggle with that, that very question and, and balance, finding the right balance. So I, I should say that um, 
all of those links are an anomaly to our daily messaging cadence within the social media channels. It was really to help support the launch of this new product line. So the PR team runs all of our social media channels and they do a great job of ensuring that there's a unique value exchange for each platform. So what you might get in a given day on Facebook could be totally different than, than the tweets that you're seeing from our head of PR. And that's very different than the post on Tumblr that was a Vogue feature from a couple of years ago, let's say. So if I look at um, the world in, that I control, which again is, is e-commerce, then I'm going to focus on trying to marry and really romance the merchandising copy alongside um, functional product messaging. So I, I know that doesn't really answer your question, but um, our PR team does a really fantastic job, I think, of, of finding that right balance. We see it in the number of followers, the monthly active uniques, the retweets. So uh, it, that was really an, an anomaly to see that many links on product. Um, that's normally not the case in that channel. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, but I know that these guys will be around uh, after the session. I encourage you to connect with them afterwards. So let's give a last kind of big round of applause. They did a great job. Thank you.